Hi, everyone. Plastic EP again. And I've got my very special guest, Mitch Weisman. How are you, Mitch? Mitch is good. Mitch is very good. Thank you. Thank you. Plastic, it's good to see you. Me too. Let's talk now about Kiss. I can't wait to hear your stories. <laughs> Should we start it again? Please. Okay. Well, my Kiss introduction came, um, you know, everybody knew who they were in 76 when I was playing in my cover bands on Long Island and stuff like that. 73, 4, actually, now that I think about it. Uh, but I didn't wasn't a big fan. But I had a friend who was in the band as our roadie whose kid brother was a huge Kiss freak, he used to come over and watch us play and then call us names for not playing any Kiss songs in this cover band. <laughs> so uh, skip a few years ahead to um, New York City where we're rehearsing for Beatlemania, 1976, 1977. And in comes Paul and Gene, who were rehearsing in the next room for, with Ace and Peter for a tour at the end of the week. And they come in, they say, we were like blown away that they came in to watch us rehearse. And then they picked up the song lists and said, play this song, play that song, play this song. Huge Beatle fans that they were. So we serenaded them for four hours straight to the point where my voice was getting almost like it is right now, right now from all this talking. So, um, but then the next day they invited us into their studio. Ace, his Marshall head starts burning and Gene pops a bass string and we were escorted out of the studio immediately to the point where they were totally embarrassed. A couple of nights later at a club in Manhattan, a woman comes up to me and asks me, are you Mitch Weissman from Beatlemania? I said, yes. She said, well, I'm Lydia Chris, Peter's wife. And um, I just want you to know that Peter was so embarrassed and so were Gene and Paul that everything, and even Ace, that everything blew up on you. They were just so mortified because as far as they were concerned, you were the Beatles for them the day before, and they wanted to give you a great performance the next day. So I got to, I just thought that was a great story. Couldn't really confirm it or anything like that, except that years later, uh, this is how I ended up reconnecting with them. There was a barbecue on the roof of Pepe Castro's apartment and his girlfriend, Diane, in midtown, in the mid-20s in, in, in lower Manhattan. Uh, they had the bell hooked up to ring it to, from the roof. So the cord went down the front. I remember going up to the rooftop and there's Paul Stanley, who I hadn't seen since those days where actually we rehearsed for them. They didn't play for us. We got tickets to the Kiss show at Madison Square Garden. Regardless, we saw them again there. Um, and they, the show was fantastic. So years later in the early 80s, I'm at this party. Paul Stanley says to me, uh, we're having a great time here and talking all this stuff. Why don't, well, here's my phone number, just call me. I took his phone number. I went home, I wake up the next day and I look at the piece of paper with his signature and his phone number. I said, I can't call him. My then wife said, why not? I said, it's Paul Stanley. I can't call Paul Stanley. I, you don't just call people like Paul Stanley or this rock guy or that guy. Um, Cause even though I was doing Broadway stuff and was associating with big people, this is, there are some people you just go either rightly so or not. I can't call that guy. Turns out a year goes by one year later at the same barbecue on July 4th, Paul comes up to me and says, how come you never called me? I told him, I said, because I woke up and I went, you're Paul Stanley. I can't call Paul Stanley. He punches me in the shoulder almost as hard as he could and says to me, you idiots, don't ever do that again. Call me. And that's how our friendship started from that day forward to the point where he and I, or Gene and I, or he and Gene and I would go out all the time, but sometimes with Eric and have fun around town and see different people, stuff like that. I met Cher, I met all everybody under the sun, you name it. But, uh, I used to stay at Gene's apartment to write songs um, when he would be on the road. I saw all those photos with all those women. I can tell you some of those women I actually knew, but I've never told them. Uh, and in his little sound recording studio, I also had the had the keys to the elevator into the apartment, right on his little studio setup. The phone would ring. It would be Cher. The phone would ring. It would be Diana Ross. The phone would ring. This guy, that guy. I just pick up the phone. Everybody knew me just from being Gene's friend. Um, and as well as just the performances. So it was a, it was a, those were fun times. I mean, I, I just, I can't believe we were, we were friends on a very daily basis. It was, it was great. Sometimes Gene and I would call up and tell each other jokes. Turns out one night we were reading jokes to each other from the same joke book. So we just were <laughs> laughing our heads off. So it was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, and one of the other more amazing stories about Kiss is they were doing the Animalize album. Um, and, Mark St. John 
hand isn't working very well. And Paul asks me in the studio, can you get a hold of, hold of Bruce Kulik for me? I can't get a hold of Bob, so I can't find his phone number. So I said, okay. And I went out to the right track to the recording studio, got out the big Queens yellow pages and started looking up Kulik's. It's a good thing Bruce's last name wasn't Smith. So I start making phone calls and I call through three or four different Kulik's leaving messages on answering machines or not getting any answer at all. Uh, I never got one person saying, no, you got the wrong number. But eventually about 10 phone calls in, I got an answering machine. I start leaving the message. I, I'm not sure if this is Bruce Kulik or not. Um, because it said you've reached the Culex, uh, and it wasn't Bruce's voice, but he picks up the phone. He was there just relaxing, taking some time off our personal issues that were going on in his life. And as he put it in his interviews, I wasn't taking any phone calls, but I heard Mitch's voice, and I liked Mitch, and I knew Mitch, so I answered the phone. And from there, I said, Paul's looking for you. Mark's having some troubles. He'd like you to play some ghost guitar. Bruce just told this story recently without me in it, but it's true. Paul called him. I, found, I tracked him down, and the rest is, I'll say it, history. Bruce and history. Yeah. <laughs> Have you seen some of their books? I can't believe their books because, look, the Beatles came into, like, memorabilia and started selling collectibles and things like that in the early years, but Kiss wrote yeah. the books. They are the most, the biggest group in history to have so many collectibles and memorabilia done about them, they are totally right the book. Yeah, Gene, Gene and Paul were amazing businessmen along with their marketing people. Um, Gene will, will, as Bruce said in a recent interview I just listened to yesterday, Gene will trademark almost anything. Paul is very good business acumen, business sense. Um, after all these years, they've got, their, they've got it down. They've got their partnership down. They've got their relationship down. At the time in the 80s when I was friends with both of them, that was odd because they didn't have a lot of socialized friends that they dealt with together. And so people found it odd in the office that how can you be friends with both of them? Because we respected each other. We also, there was very, occasionally there'd be things that Gene would say, well, this is between you and me. Occasionally Paul would say the same thing between you and me. And then Gene would say to me, what'd you guys do last night? I'd say, I can't tell you. And Paul would go, what'd you guys do last night? I'm not telling you. And we'd all start three-way conversations laughing our asses off. Uh, but as we remained friends for years, and I think I told you, I started writing with them after being friends with them for what turned into the Creatures of the Night album. And I didn't get any songs on it. And they said to me, uh, you... Um, Mitch, they called me on the phone for the studio if this didn't happen in the last conversation. Um, we're not going to use any of your songs. I was on the speakerphone. And what they liked about that was they were waiting for me to just be upset, as Paul says in other interviews, when you write with a friend, if it doesn't work out, you lose that friend. In my case, apparently my reaction to Gene, I said to them, I said, Gene, tell them what I told you. He said, Mitch went, gee, that's really too bad. Or actually in those days, it was the word bummer. When you come back to New York, on Tuesday, where are we having dinner? So it like when it's, they said, did you hear us? We're not using the songs. Yes, yeah, so where are we eating on Tuesday? That's that's what they, they were my friends. If the writing didn't work out, they were still gonna be my friends. So it didn't, and then years later, I had three songs on Animalize. And I remember Paul saying to me, what'd you eat? What, did you eat something different? I mean, these songs are great. I'm like, I don't know, it's the same thing. They just, it just clicked. There's even some unreleased material which I'm planning on releasing at a certain time, but right now this economic turned down and this pan pandemic can't use the studio. I don't have home recording equipment. There are demos out there on the internet. You can actually hear some of the stuff that Gene and I did and just that never made it. Um, and Paul rewrote one of my songs to the point where I was upset, except that now I have a rewrite and another song. Um, so we were friends for a long, long time. And when it came time to do the Lick It Up album cover and take off their makeup, um, I'm at Paul, uh, Paul's apartment on the west side, on the east side. Gene is at, is at his place off Central Park West, and I'm in the bathroom on the phone extension. Paul's in the living room, and we're trying to figure out what the photo should be for the cover of Lick It Up, the first official no, no makeup album cover. And as I'm going through the C prints, the large prints from the photographers um, to go through, I'm looking through all these prints and it's just a generic sort of band shot with them in those regular clothes and posed. Paul, G both Eric and Vinny are standing on, on phone books to make them a little taller. Um, Vinny is wearing a wig because his hair used to just droop down around his head. And Paul said he looked like a drowned rat. 
Um, Vinny and I laugh about that when we tell that story. Um, but the very last shot on the roll, I screamed from the bathroom, I've got your cover photo. I was in graphic design before this, before my music career. But I said, I've got your cover photo. And Gene says, what? I said, go pull out the last photo on the reel. The very last photo on the reel or the, of the photos is Gene Simmons sticking his tongue out to the photographer. Because the photographer had said to him, okay, this is the last photo. So do what you're going to do. And Gene instinctively just stuck out his tongue. And I said to him, what is, I said to them, what is the one piece of KISS paraphernalia that you can never take off? And Paul said, holy crap, Gene's tongue. And that became the link between what band is this and KISS. So when you saw that cover and you knew it was a KISS album, you could see that it was KISS because there is the one piece of costume you couldn't remove. And you recognized it and they did it. Yeah, they used the photo. Unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> That's a story and a half. Now tell me about when you guys were hanging around and driving around and going to lunches and that. Didn't you have a lot of people coming up to you and wanting autographs and all the mania? They did. There's a very funny story. when Around the time when Live Aid was being done, they were recording at uh, Electric Lady, Jimi Hendrix's studio, the legendary place in Manhattan on 8th Street. I was there every day because I just was hanging out. I don't think it was an album that had any of my songs on it because um, I believe they did uh, Crazy Nights, which I had a song on in Los Angeles with Ron Nevison, the producer. Um, but the album they were doing, Electric Lady, I'm not sure what that turned into. But we're walking around out there. Rick Ocasek and the cars are in one room. I'm sitting watching Live Aid, which is funny. I'm watching Live Aid and five hours later, there's Paul at Live Aid. I didn't even, I didn't even realize he left the studio and went out to Live Aid um, to just watch the show. But um, we're on the on A Street and we're going through little delicatessens and Gene and I are walking down the street and these kids and black kids and Hispanic kids of it are yelling from across the street and delivery guys, yo, Paul! And Gene's turning to him and saying, it's Gene. It's Gene. And they go, another guy, yo, Paul. And he goes, it's Gene. And eventually I said to him, uh, you know who they're yelling Paul to, don't you? And he goes like, holy shit. <laughs> he was so hysterically laughing. He dragged me back to the studio and said, you're never going to believe this story. And sure enough, Michael Jackson and Paul McCartney had just had Say, Say, Say come out. So everybody is recognizing, Michael Jackson fans are recognizing Paul McCartney on the street with this other rock musician. Whereas Gene thought <laughs> they were getting his name wrong and talking about his partner, they were really talking about Paul McCartney, which was me. So it was pretty funny. <laughs> now I get it. I get it. If you, if you want to see another funny clip, you should see Paul's Heavy Metal Mania, where he hosts um, the evening and the videos from his apartment in Manhattan. And he had me on as a Paul McCartney lookalike. Maybe Paul, maybe not. Um, and I'm in the, in the show. Uh, and uh, he talks about, isn't it great to be a rock star? You never have, know who's going to come over to the apartment. The butler in the clip is Keith Hernandez from the New York Mets, the Amazing Mets, 1969. So we we had a lot of fun back in those days. Unbelievable. What yeah. other Kiss yeah. story can you tell me? i got to just well, get a couple more Kiss stories. In 1984, they were doing the tour for Animalize, and uh, they're in Cleveland, and it's around the fall, almost Christmas time. My wife said, what do you want for Christmas? I said, I think I want to go out and visit the boys in Cleveland. And um, she said, Cleveland? I said, yeah, Cleveland. <laughs> so I'd like Cleveland. I actually played Cleveland with the Beatlemania tour and stuff like that. But I, and, and different, different, you know, small shows and stuff, not as myself, but with other guys. I ended up flying out there and got booked in the hotel with the guys and, um, they were there for like three days, and then we did the show. And I remember at Soundcheck, this is when Bruce is in the band, um, officially. At Soundcheck, they're going through songs on stage, and I'm off in the in the corner uh, on by the sound by the mixing console, and they start Mississippi Queen by by Mountain. And Paul motions me over, and they keep playing the intro. And he pulls me over, he sits me center stage, and he gives me the mic, and I sing Mississippi Queen with Kiss as my backup band. Um, the guys opening for them on the tour were extreme, um, or 
I forgot who. I think it was extreme. It maybe not have been extreme. It might have been. Anyway, it's just another band from back then. And I can't remember that. Had that huge song, Silent Lucidity. So I can't remember what band that was. Uh, um, not King's X. You, you'll know this. You'll know the band. You guys out there, you can look it up. Whoever did Silent Lucidity, that's a huge monster hit for that band. They're watching from the stage, going, "Who the hell is that guy?" Because I was just hanging out with that. Of course, I'm very Beatlesque, and I'm singing hard rock vocals, and it was just a great moment to be on that stage. Yeah. Even yourself now, as you said, you're walking the street and they're yelling Paul and that. Do you look more like Paul or yourself when you're on the street? That, uh, that's a good question. Well, that's the, the, it's not Kiss related, but what was happening was, back then, 77, the show was on Broadway. And a snowstorm hit Manhattan. And I lived two blocks away from, from John and Yoko on 72nd Street. I lived on 74th Street in Central Park West for a lot of years. A small apartment behind the big buildings. Uh, one bedroom. I remember one morning having to go to the hardware store to buy shelving that you put on the shelves and you stuck the shelves in it and you put the board across. And I had to go to the supermarket to buy some groceries. And I go downstairs in these jeans from 1976, really Big bell-bottom sailor-type jeans. I'm wearing my glasses. My hair is a mess. You, you're kind of like a woman going, please, like you're going out in curlers. And you're saying, to, to me anyway, um, and you're saying, please, God, don't let anybody recognize me while I go out there. So I go out in the morning. I go buy this stuff. I start walking back to my corner of 74th Street from the south. And coming from the north is John and Yoko and another guy with them from breakfast at a place called Ruel's that was a block north of it. I get to the corner of the block and I'm in my mind, I'm going, holy shit, it's John Lennon. I get to about the holy shit part when this voice booms out, well, good morning, Paul. How are you, Paul? Look, honey, it's, look, honey, it's, it's Paul. Um, and she, and he says, he looks just like him, doesn't he? And she goes, yeah, he does. And so I'm like, I'm like stunned. I'm standing there with my groceries and my curtain and my, shelving rods and he puts me up out of the sidewalk out of the gutter into the on the sidewalk and he sends to his friend he said you know we should use him on that tv special i said uh, I, I i live down the block he says don't worry i know where to find you he says you know my 16 year old saw the show uh and said dad you know the guy who plays you doesn't look much like you julian and i have laughed about this over the years the guy who plays you doesn't look much like you but you gotta see the guy who plays paul he looks just like him doesn't he honey and she goes yeah he does like she, she said again and then he says well, you know you should form a band with three guys and a chick singer and call it wings and tour the world and i said to him i think it's been done he said no you should do that form a band to call it wings and tour the world he said to me so how do you do so many shows a week and I said to him, well, you know, we have monitors, things that they didn't have back then. He says, no, no, it's got to be really hard for you to do those shows. I said, yeah, it's, it's, it's a little tough, especially on the matinee days when it sounds like the screaming kids coming in from the schools sounds just like the Hollywood Bowl albums. And, you know, I use, use some of the lines from the album. Can you hear me? And the whole audience goes, ah, even louder. Um, so, you you know, so he just he said, well, I know where to find you. He says, and I as I – as they disappeared down the block towards their house, towards their apartment, I turn around in the street and it turns into a Jerry Lewis moment. There was no one on the street. Absolutely no one in any direction I could possibly find. So you're going like, did you, did you, did anybody, did you, did you see? I mean, like, did that really happen? And I remember going upstairs to my apartment, five floors up and getting upstairs and my wife says, what happened? And I'm going, <laughs> And I turned into Lou Costello um, from Abbott and Costello. I couldn't say a word. But when I got out, I just talked to John and Yoko. She had her same moment. So, yeah, we became friends after that, from that first meeting. Had three different conversations over the years. I know it's not a kiss story, but that's another brush with, brush with, <laughs> brush with, with, with fame. <laughs> that story is unbelievable. I just showed that picture when I went to Central Park and I went to Strawberry Fields. Yeah. There's somebody selling stuff there, and I bought one of the imagined pictures of yes. the circle, and also that one there with John and Yoko walking in Central Park. Yeah. It's amazing. I've been to America three times, and you've, you've been to Australia five or six. That's right. Yeah. I've been everywhere from Bendigo to oh. uh, to Burswood to every service club everywhere in the damn place, driving hours and hours. It was so much fun. It was fantastic. 
Do you know there's a song called I've Been Everywhere, Man? Have you heard that, the Australian classic? I think I have, yeah. I have. The guy says every single town in Australia in that song, I've Been Everywhere, Man. You might, uh, you might want to listen to that today. Do it, absolutely, yeah. Now, come on, let's go back to Kiss, all right? But that sure. John story is a ripper. Have you There's, run into um, Paul? Have you run into Paul? I have run into Paul um, over the years. We haven't spoken in a lot of years. There's, a, there's I, Paul, as a, other friends have said to me, other people that worked with them, that when you, when you've done something, I may, probably not even living up to my potential. I'll just be honest about it. I mean, it, uh, these guys will say, "Oh, uh, that's it. You're done." Paul and I were friends for a lot of years. Uh, like I said, called each other every day, saw each other all the time, um, hung out. He went through a breakup that I was a little bit insensitive to at the time. He said, I'm going to my apartment. I said, okay, have a nice time. And meanwhile, that was supposed to be my cue to go with him, but I didn't. And he was a little upset with that. The other thing is Billy Squire and I became very, very good friends. And he lived literally out the door, 60 feet this way and 100 feet that way. And we used to hang out just because it was convenient. But also the three of us would, would hang out. Paul was very interested in how Billy could do songs and perform as Billy Squire, whereas the Kiss persona gave him not, you were Paul Stanley, but you were the different Paul Stanley. How could you be so intimate? They used to have discussions about that stuff. Um, but the thing is, I think my relationship just kind of migrated over that way. Of course, Kiss was still touring, so I didn't see him all the time. Billy was making albums and touring sporadically, uh, didn't need to tour, but he was, you know, but we became very, very friendly that way as well. Gene and I stayed on the phones all the time. I've spoken to Gene recently by email. Um, I visited his house once in LA a few years back when with my with my lovely final and love of my life wife Jackie Santon. We went to the house of the one you see on the TV show. Um, or as I used to stay at his house in the 90s, the first one he had, across the street, he got it when he was dating Cher. And he lived across the street from her in Coldwater Canyon. So I had the the private code, the keys to the house, used to stay in the apartment above the garage when he just had a two-story, you know, one-story ranch home. He eventually got rid of that to build everything you see on that TV. He told me he got rid of that apartment above the garage because one time Ted Nugent was staying there when he's having issues with his wife. And Gene came down from the house with coffee and Ted rolled out of bed with a 40, with a, <laughs> a 44 Magnum, pointed at him, and Gene went, that's it, I have to get rid of this place. <laughs> he wouldn't have fitted his collectibles in that other place. Uh, at the other place, there were plenty. As a matter of fact, when we came into the house, we met. We came up to the compound. The gate was the same. The security keypad was the same. I didn't remember the security code. It was probably changed by then. But when you drove into the compound, then you have the massive house in the in the background. You have actually people patrolling on the grounds because there was a television crew and they're filming Family Jewels. And we come into the house. The guy gets the call. Yeah, come on in. They're looking at me like, who is this guy? Because we we we'd run into each other at a party. For Barry Levine, the photographer who took all the Kiss photos in the early years with Niels Lazauer and uh, and Preston, um, these guys. So Barry was friends with them forever. You see Barry actually in when Gene and and Shannon go to renew their vows in Japan. They, Barry went with them. Um, so Barry remained friends. But Barry had a company uh, called Revolution Comics, and there was a party for for him. And so we ran into him. He said, "Come to the party." And there was Wesley Snipes. You name it, everybody and their mother was at that party, and that's where Gene was. And he walked across the room and said, Mitch Weissman, and, and Jackie liked him immediately. And he said, come to the house. So I wrote him a note saying, "How I'd love to come visit. I waited about four or five days. And he said, how about now? I'm going, what? How about now? So I said, okay, well, we're coming over. And Jackie said, I, he didn't say me. I started wrote him back, can I bring Jackie? He goes, yeah, come on over. So we came over. We get inside the house. We go upstairs. He's filming green screen stuff behind him. You know, it's the stuff that the inserts into the into the program. And he starts singing Jackie Blue, that song, Ooh, Jackie Blue. That was a big hit in the 70s. And um, I think that was Nick Gilder. I can't remember. That was, hot, that was Hot Child in the City. He's singing Jackie Blue. And I immediately noticed his office off to the side with every one of those collectibles in it, including, I think, the coffin was in there, too. And I veer into that room. And I'm not paying any attention to him at all. And he's saying to me, hey, you're not paying attention to me. And I go, yeah, I don't want to pay attention to you. I want to see the toys. And the whole staff and the crew start laughing. They have to stop taping. 
So, yeah, so I, I got into that house. We went downstairs. Gene uh, starts feeding us from the kitchen. So he goes to the refrigerator. We're taking out all this stuff like, like two Jewish kids at a delicatessen. We're eating food. Shannon comes in. The kids come in. And we just had a great time, a nice sociable time. That's a great story, that. But as I said, I don't want to say too much about Gene, but he's the real standout character in Kiss, isn't he? He's a character, all right. I mean, you know, they, they both, they, you know, they used to be a lot more happy-go-lucky. It's funny, when I met them at the airport once, I was picking up my wife, and there was Peter Tork from the Monkees waiting for somebody to show up, and there I am at the gate, and here comes Gene and, and Shannon back from that trip to Japan. And uh, I mentioned some stuff that I'd seen, and actually Shannon was very happy to see me. Sometimes she's not happy to see anybody, but she was happy to see me. And uh, she, um, and Jean said, you remember? And she said, look, it's Mitch. And she, he said, we're talking, having a good time. And I started talking about things I remember. And he says, how do you remember all these things? I said, some of you guys lived the life. I just remember the stories. So, um, and he was very, very nice. And it's, we, we've conversed by email occasionally. When The Vault came out, I actually wanted to know if one, any of my stuff was in it. Uh, coincidentally, no, it's not. But there's going to be more Vault versions. Uh, he actually sent me a smiley face back when he when I said, I hear this little birdie says, you're considering one of our songs. He actually has a version of, of an earlier version of our song that has nothing to do with us, the way it ended up on the vault with the same title. So that's why I was wondering whether it was the same song. But anyway, if when I email him, he, email, he email me, emails me back. That's great. i got to tell you, even though we're talking about Kiss, I'm a big Monkees fan. Oh, uh, I got some stories of that. Please, please. <laughs> okay, so in 1990-something, my band Liverpool, which was the house band for the, the then Beatles Fest, it's now it's called the Fest for Beatles Fans, but for years it was called Beatles Fest. That's a fest where everybody that had to do with the Beatles is invited as a guest, and the fans celebrate like a kiss convention. Um, Beatles have never shown. Uh, Julian Lennon has never shown up. But everybody else, from Alan Parsons to Lawrence Jubert, uh, Steve Holly, um... Denny Lane, you name it, the people in their lives have been at that convention. Uh, even, uh, what's his name, Pete Best, for years, it's been, went on for years. I didn't, I went once in 1976. Interesting story is, 76, I went to one of the ones, the first ones in Manhattan. I'm walking around with my sunglasses. There's a, there's a shot of me online somewhere. And everybody thought I was Walmart McCarty. It was one of those times where it, it, it was very amazing. And Sid Bernstein actually invited me to the, to the performance. The next thing I know, my friend Bernadette Peters, she was there. Uh, Bernadette Edwards, she took photos, some photos of me with that with at that convention. This was in 1976 when I'm rehearsing for Beatlemania. Sid made a measure from the stage. Is a show going to happen? I sat in with the house band that did get back with them. Uh, Bernadette had a, a picture of me that she took from that show, and year, a few years later, she actually actually in 1977 she came to my apartment in Manhattan and said, "I have something for you." It's the picture of me that's online, but on the back is a signature. She showed it to John Lennon in front of the Dakota, and he signed my photo. So I never got a chance to ask him about that. Don't ask me where the photo is. I have absolutely no idea. Yeah, but it's somewhere in my belongings. We were talking so, about the monkeys, too. The monkeys, yeah. The monkeys, it was funny. So in the 90s, that band Liverpool, is how this all started, was um, we were doing... Liverpool was the first Beatle band that actually I played with and got with no costumes. So we did no costume gigs and we used to open for the very first person we were open for and then backed up was actually Peter Noon from Herman's Hermits. Uh, I remember when I got this tour in 2012 with the Turtles and I played bass for them. Uh, it was called the, uh, oh gosh, I forgot the name of it. And they, it goes out every year. Uh, happy, to get, happy to get the tour. So I'm playing yep. bass for the Turtles for Gary Puckett from the Union Gap, and for, I forgot the third person. Oh, Mickey Dolans from the Monkees. Well, before I got that, um, I did Herman's Hermits. I did, I did backed up Peter Noon. We did the Beatles, and we backed up Peter. Then the next thing I get is another thing. I remember where, and Mickey, I was friends with Mickey in the 90s, but we never did need, we, we started backing him up. We were going to go with him to Germany and do some shows there, and Kevin Allen, who was, who, was their manager at the time and also managed a whole lot of other bands too. He says to me one night, I wish I could get Mickey and Davey back together again. Because by the, the monkeys had already done that three person tour, but then they weren't doing it anymore. Peter didn't want to do it anymore. Everybody had issues with Davey. No one was talking to Davey. Um, 
they were pissed at Mike for leaving them in, in England and having to do the tour with just the three of them. I remember at Hal, Hal Blaine, the legendary session drummer, had a book signing. And I remember Mickey smiling for the cameras going, fuck you, ha, ha, fuck you, Mikey, M Michael Dolans, uh, Michael, Michael Nesbeth. I mean, so obviously they're, they're like brothers. You love them, you hate them, whatever it was. But they made their peace and went back. Well, the thing is, Kevin says, I really wish I could get Mickey and Davey back together because they'd be great touring together. So I said, leave it to me. Because I knew Mark Clark, who was the bass player, and, and Sandy Gennaro, the drummer, for Davey's solo act back then. And I had them meet me at a, at a club in Manhattan. And, and Mickey and I were going around town at night anyway, drinking wine and singing songs and doing crazy things. Um, so Kevin brings him to this bar. I had gone to the China Club in Manhattan and talked to Davey and... Mark Clark got Davey to come to the same bar. I left them all talking and having a great time. The feud, whatever it was, was over. I go home. Kevin calls me the next morning. He says, I have good news and bad news. The good news is your plan worked. They're back together. They're going to tour. It's absolutely fantastic. The bad news is one of the conditions is Davey has to use his band. So you're out of a job. <laughs> And as I said, it was perfectly fine with me um, because it's all about the friends, really. Be nice to be working, and I was, but I replaced myself by getting the two of them together. And then we had those, then eventually that led to all those monkey tours. So um, pretty interesting, pretty interesting stuff. And then it's I got to, The people yeah. I interview, the hardcore Beatles people, they're monkey fans. Yeah, I know. You're a monkey fan too, aren't you? I was a huge monkey fan. One of my favorite albums when I was growing up was Headquarters because it was very much like their Sgt. Pepper record. That's the one where they played all the instruments on it themselves, wrote all the songs. Um, I don't think Screen Gems and everybody else promoted them as well as they should have. And I think they did it on purpose because Don Kirshner and everybody was pissed off that they did an album by themselves. But those songs are unbelievable. And those performances are great. Um, and they were, and they proved it when they did those comeback tours, 2012, and before they did those songs. Mitch, I've got to ask you another question. When you were doing Beatlemania, the MC was Murray the K, yeah. Uh, Murray the K was with us in the beginning. So was actually Alan Williams, their first manager. They brought in people that were, were involved with them in Germany, um, stuff like that. Murray was in New York. The Lieber Krebs were. It made perfect sense to have him trying to kind of be like the emissary for our interviews and stuff like that. And the guy, a legitimate guy to talk to the world about what was coming. And Murray was there when the Beatles came. Murray's here again announcing Beatlemania. Uh, he was with us for, at the beginning. After the show opened, he, I guess there was something. He went to California and made more of a name for himself again. Um, it was just great being, being, being with Murray, and I, and I I don't remember how many stories I asked him about. He really didn't go on. He wasn't the sort of guy, as much as he was a self-promotion guy all the time, um, he didn't try to drive us crazy and tell us this is what you do. and this Because he, he met them. He didn't have nothing to do with their performing. But he was a great guy and a great character. Really great. Uh, sad story is when he was finally dying years later at his home in Beverly Hills. Uh, the amazing thing is that People were with him at his house for weeks and months at a time. And when I would call to say hello, the phone was answered by Tony Orlando. It was answered by Dionne Warwick. It was answered by all his friends to take the phone calls because sometimes Murray couldn't speak himself. He was so in such pain. You know, Mitch, you've told us some amazing stories. And I can't thank you enough for this interview on Kiss, on John Lennon on the monkeys, you know, it's just, we're talking rock, you know, it's like my scene, like, you know, and your scene too. It's yeah. like amazing. And let me tell you, from Plastic EP, we've got to wind that up, but I've got to thank you so much. This second interview, they've got to see part one as well about Beatlemania, but this one about Kiss, as we say in Australia, it's a ripper, mate. And when you come back to Melbourne, I want you to look me up. I want to catch up and chat your drink. That's the least I can do. I'd love to. I'd also like to give and say hello to our friend Stuart Hirsch, 
who without him, this wouldn't have been possible. <laughs> exactly. How are you, Stuart? You know, I'll tell you this, Mitch. I've sent him three Skippy plates from the TV yeah. show Skippy. Yeah. Do you remember the TV show Skippy, the bush kangaroo? Yes, I do, actually. <laughs> okay, what happens is I've got three collectibles and they're on the way to Stu's house. They left oh the God. 27th of April. And as soon as he receives it, we're going to do a live show of him opening the box of the three plates that I've sent him. <laughs> okay. From the 60s. From the 60s. Yeah. Those plates are made by a company called Bessemer. And one's a plate that you have your dinner on it. One's another I'm cereal bowl. And one's yeah. another like an ornament plate. Really? Wow. Yeah. And there's a lot of people, believe it or not, can't wait to tune in to watch him open the box and get the Skippy collectible. That's gonna be, that'll be big. That'll be very, very it's, it, Anytime there's a collectible that's being opened like that, it's kind of crazy. Great. But I'll tell you what, when it happens, you'll be the first person, I promise, I send yeah, you the link. Let me know. I, I want to watch live. <laughs> okay, I'll send you the link before we do it. Don't worry. Anyway, Mitch, stay there. From Plastic EP and Mitch Weissman. It's Cheers been a pleasure. It's good on you. Talk to you soon. Good on you, mate. Good on you, mate. Bye. Bye.